So today what I'm going to do is um, give you a brief, well, I suppose it'll go for a little while, but presentation about the results of what our team, and, and which in, uh, included a number of different groups um, from the United States and so on, and you can see them. These are the science groups here, two from the US and the University of Waikato, and three from the US and us here. And I can say right here and now that if it wasn't for uh, these groups helping us with the high-tech gear that we had, um, it would be very difficult um, to us to do this project. Can you hear me at the back all right? Is that all right? Can Keep your voice up if you can. Okay. Can we turn the lights out, please? All right. So let's start. So this is what we tried to do from the very outset. We knew that there was this subaerial or above land geothermal system in this particular part of the world and it was manifest by these two absolutely spectacular iconic features known as the pink here in the foreground and the white terraces. Um, as Anaru said, these were um, uh, really quite uh, iconic things that people had come from all around the world to see. And in fact, there were tourist groups came all the way from the US would spend three or four months just to get here to have a look. But as scientists, we wanted to know what had happened, not so much what had happened to the terraces, because most people believe they'd been destroyed, but really what happens when you flood something like this, so you have all this outpouring of hot water up here, which cascades down and forms these terraces, but if you drown it such that there's a lake sitting on top of it, what would likely happen to it? So that was really our main scientific mission, and that's how you get the money, all right? <laughs> If you don't say things like that, you don't get the money. So this is the team. This is the, um, the people represented by the various institutions around the world. And we did this, obviously, in collaboration, particularly with the Te Arua Lakes Trust Board. But a number of people here um, were very helpful to us. And we had some great times on the local marae as well. So I'd just like to acknowledge these people. This is what we did. We had, we had, these are called AUVs. An AUV is an autonomous underwater vehicle. So it's not tethered to a ship. It can be programmed a bit like an MX missile. We can put the program into it and it can go down into the lake. It can hug the lake shore. It can do what we tell it to do um, with a bit of luck. So there were two of these AUVs brought all the way from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Boston. Um, very, very high tech. Um, they're the two names that they call them. One of them did 130 kilometers of lines on the lake floor. The other one did almost 200 k's. Um, we can measure a number of different properties of the water. This means conductivity, depth, temperature, pH is a measure of acidity like a carbactory acid and various things. Turbidity is whether or not there are particulates in the water column um, from these hydrothermal fluids. We also did a number of other things, and when I go through the rest of the talk, I'll start with this first and we'll end with this last. We tried to measure the magnetic signal of the rocks that are underlying the lake, 110 kilometers worth of survey. We got a lot of these are the samples of water down depth, we had camera stations, got sediments and so on. And in the end, in two weeks, we did about almost 1,800 hours of work in two weeks, so you figure out how many hours a day that was for most people, <laughs> about 18 hour days. One of the things that uh, my colleague here, Julian, did at GNS, we decided to have an outreach component to this, and part of this outreach component was a poster competition for schools in the local Rotorua uh, district area. And what they, their, their brief was, it was primary schools really, I think, and the brief was, what are we going to find? And uh, it was quite incredible. This was hosted by the the main library here in Rotorua, and um, I forget how many posters there were, a hundred or so, I, I, I don't recall, and some of them were absolutely spectacular. They had penguins, um, <laughs> they had pots of gold, of course, that one was a good one, <laughs> and so they have a variety of different things that were on the bottom of the lake, but there were some that were particularly accurate, and uh, here's just a few of them, and we went on and we awarded caps and things to these kids, and you know, they loved it. They loved to do a little bit of science in their own backyard. So this was quite an incredible display. We've also on YouTube, if you go on YouTube, we have two YouTubes at the moment. Um, one of them, if you type in Lake Rotomahana, the other one if you type in Peak Terraces, between them there's over 20,000 views from around the world. This was, by the way, was, um, was all mentioned in Russia and China and India and all around the world. So just a brief recap. Um, this was the pre-1886 
Lake Rotomahana and this other smaller lake here. Um, you can see Mount Tarawera up here with these different uh, Tarawera craters and so on. And basically what happened during the eruption of 1886 that the earth just unzipped and we have what we call a big rift and it came all the way through here, here and you can see this today obviously and it also came underneath or down through where pre-existing um, lakes were and we believe some of it came up underneath the lake. That's why it was so explosive in this particular area and this entire area here you can see this is where the main blast came out and these are numbers of people that were killed. So it's one of the reasons if you put hot magma and you mix it with, with water or groundwater, it's a very, very explosive um, cocktail. So un not surprisingly, although very unfortunately, um, a lot of people got killed in this particular um, area. So the lakes used to be of this size. This is the current outline of the lake now. It's um, about five times bigger and it's significantly deeper, a good hundred odd meters deeper since then. So prior, before we talk about what we did in the lake, we're going to talk to you a little bit about what we did around the lake. And in order to try and put in context some of the measurements that we do in the lake, we have to try and see if we can measure these things around the lake. And in this instance, we're measuring gravity and magnetics. So what we're trying to do is to have some insight to what the rocks and the structure is like beneath um, the land in which you walk. So we had the crews going around taking these various measurements. Here's a measurement of gravity, a measurement of uh, magnetics through the forest. And uh, this was all done in the near vicinity of uh, Lake Rotomahana itself. So that there are some tracks and there's some farmer's roads and so on. And then we also had a small boat taking people around the lake, dropping the people off so they can do these different measurements. So that was to try and put in context what we were going to do on the lake. You can see Edgecombe here, and you can see the Tarawera rifts through there, and we know that they came right down through the old lake area and formed New Zealand's youngest geothermal system here in Waimangu um, in uh, 1886, or shortly thereafter. So the lake is much bigger than it used to be. The pink terraces used to be around here somewhere. The white terraces used to be around there somewhere. And so that's, that's the scene for what we came to work on earlier this year. So we, in and out every day, we just have this convoy. I mean, uh, getting into the lake, as uh, if you're locals, you'll know, it's not particularly easy. There's no main this way. This is through the forest, and, and uh, fortunately for us, the forestry people were really um, very helpful, and they allowed us access during the course of this project. But nevertheless, it was a bit of a pain that we had to go in and out every day, and uh, but perhaps that's one of the reasons why, why Rotomahana is so... Uh, special I think because it's very difficult to get to and it's very very isolated and this is this is a typical shot of one day on the boat you can see Tarawera in the background here's one of these rifts and all around here except for the very eastern part where there's some farmland it's just this bush and I remember thinking during the course of this project how it was like Jurassic Park somewhat there's no real obvious sign of man or mankind except these farms and uh, I thought it was a very special place to work. Also, probably most of you don't know that there are some geothermal manifestations around the edges of this lake. This is one of these vents, and um, I don't know, sure if it's called the angel wings, but that's what I call it. But anyway, it's, it's a very beautiful feature, and you can see the boiling water here, and there's a little geyser off to the right-hand side. So there are geothermal manifestations around the lake. There's a lot of uh, fumaroles and uh, gas being um, expelled out of some of these cracks, but by far most of it is underneath the water. This is just, I just put this in to show you um, the consequence of that eruption. This is the Rotomahana mud, as they describe it. Um, this is just one section on the lake, and this is several meters thick, and you can imagine what it must have been like in the near vicinity of, this, of Rotomahana with this sort of mud and material being ejected from the lake during the eruption. So this is what, the buried, where the, what happened to the buried village um, and the immediate surround. So you can see quite clearly um, the mud sitting on some of the older geology. There's also like this basal surge deposit we talked about. Here's the lake again. And when you look at this, this always reminds me of when you go to Namibia and places all the sand dunes and you get this type of <coughs> phenomenon, if you like, with those um, big sand dunes. But this is not sand. 
and this was part of that debris or the material blown out of the, the lake during the eruption and you can see all this cross bedding and so on and this would have come at a great rate of knots and nobody would have stood a chance in front of this. So this was the start of the survey. What we're going to do here is to measure the magnetic signal of the rocks underneath the lake. This is a state-of-the-art magnetometer and we tow it um, behind one of the small boats. And this is the pattern of which we would do. So we'd just go up and down, up and down, up and down, and then we tie the lines in with these lines and you can see, and this is where he later did some work on the roads and that I was telling you before. So pretty good coverage of the lake. And then we measure the magnetic signal of the rocks. And so what this is, is it's just relative. But it's telling you that these colours, that the ro rocks are quite strongly magnetised, and in these colours the rocks are not. And what we measure here is we measure a mineral called magnetite. That's how all your compasses work, is that there's a me mineral magnetite which captures, when it, when it cools down, as the lava cools down, it captures the direction of the magnetic pole at that time. So that's how things work. So when you have hot water going through lavas, it destroys the magnetite, or it can destroy it from completely to partially. So this is telling you that over here, all the magnetite has been removed from the rocks. And over here, it largely is not. And this is, it's quite interesting, because this is the location of the old pink terraces, and the white terraces were up here. So what it's telling you, it's giving you a snapshot of the extent of that hydrothermal system um, prior to the 1886 eruption. So you can see it's a pretty big, by all accounts, it's a pretty big geothermal system. I mean, there's a kilometre, so it's a big one, not dissimilar to many we see in this part of the world. But also interesting is this colour here. So this is telling you have relatively fresh rock, or at least rock that has not been altered by hot water. And if you have a look down here, what you see in the cliffs, then, then you see these ignobrites. I think they're welded ignobrites, aren't they? And sort of... This is a fairly uh, significant solidified rock type, and this is what's giving you that signal that you see back here in the red. So it does give you a bit of a tool in order to map the geology that's on the lake shore. So here, though, very significant saying that this used to be um, a very large geothermal system. Then also what we did when we're going along, this is a pretty poor shot, but it doesn't matter, just from the echo sounders, we could see this is the bottom, and these are plumes. These are bubble plumes which interfere with the echo sounder so we can measure them. And as we're going along during the course of the magnetic survey, every single one of these dots is one of those plumes. And this is an absolute minimum. There are many, many more, but we would just record them as we saw them. So you can see a couple of things here, perhaps three. The most obvious one is that there is still hydrothermal activity where the pink and white terraces used to be. So the, the general area of that geothermal system still has discharge of mainly gas, but there's also some liquid occurring in the same general area, which is quite interesting. Secondly, there's this enormous area down here which is completely new. This is, this is the new geothermal system in the lake that never existed prior to the 1886 eruption. And we think that this is all located along a big fault down here, and I'll show you some other stuff later on. So there's an enormous amount of hydrothermal discharge occurring here. This is in the general area, not quite, of where the white terraces was. But, but on the whole, all things being equal, there's two main areas where we see hydrothermal activity. We also see some of it coming up in some other places around the lake. 